Um, as Ali said, my name is Linda and I work for the Key for School Governors. And today we are going to be talking about exclusions. We are going to start off by talking about what exclusions are, as well as discussing the different types of exclusions, how exclusions happen, and your role in the exclusions process. We'll also be talking about the sorts of things you need to keep in mind when considering exclusions, such as when exclusions are and aren't lawful, and which pupils are at higher risk of exclusions. And we'll finally finish off our discussion with a review of the Timpson Report, which is a review of school exclusions that was commissioned by the government. Um, there's going to be a lot of text uh, on these on these pages, so I just wanted to reassure you that you don't have to memorize or take copious notes. Uh, if you look at your screen, you should see that this deck is available as a handout. In addition, we've got my colleague, Sarah Bull, who will be sitting here ready to answer your questions. Um, should you have any, just feel free to type those into your into uh, the webinar uh, uh, dashboard. So we will go ahead and get started. Exclusions are when you either temporarily or permanently ban a pupil from school. They've been linked to a number of poor outcomes for children, and I'm just gonna throw out a few statistics uh, here right now from the Timpson Report, which I'd mentioned we would discuss later in this seminar. 23% of young offenders sentenced to 12, of 12 months of prison or more in 2014 had been permanently excluded just prior to this. Only 7% of permanently excluded children and 18% of children who received multiple fixed term exclusions went on to, to achieve good passes in their GCSEs. And over a third of pupils who finish education in alternative provision, which is what happens after you've been permanently excluded, um, were, in, were considered to be neat, which means not in education, employment, or training. In addition, exclusions have also been related to gang grooming and knife crime. So as governors, it's your job to make sure that you provide a check on the system to ensure that those exclusions that do happen are fair and appropriate. The exclusions law we're going to discuss today applies to all pupils in England who attend maintained schools, academies, and free schools, as well as pupil referral units. This also includes pupils that are above and below compulsory school age. So that means pupils in nurseries and those in, in sixth forms um, are also considered part of, uh, are also covered under the exclusions guidance. An exclusion is simply any period of time during which a pupil is not permitted to attend classes or to be on school grounds. Now, exclusions are very, very statutorily regulated. So your primary resource for finding uh, information on exclusions is going to be here in statutory guidance that's been uh, published by the Department for Education. This statutory guidance has been based on, le on legislation that was found in these, in these particular regulations. It's not anything that you need to know now, but just rest assured that should you ever have any questions, you can usually find what you need here. There are many different types of exclusions. Uh, so we are going to be talking about, um, first we'll discuss fixed term exclusions, which are often re referred to as, uh, as suspensions. These are temporary exclusions and they can range from just part of the day, such as during a lunch period, or up to a total of 45 days in a year. Now, one thing that you should know because it comes up pretty frequently is that you can't technically extend a fixed term uh, exclusion. Uh, what this means is that you can't take say a three-day exclusion and extend it to a seven-day exclusion. You actually have to take multiple actions, either have multiple fixed term exclusions that follow each other or a permanent exclusion that immediately follows a fixed term exclusion. The only reason this matters is because as governors, you could be involved in multiple reviews related to what looks like one single exclusion, simply on the basis that there were multiple exclusions that went into place. Permanent exclusions should always be a last resort, and they should only be taken when these two things are true. It has to be in response to a serious breach or persistent breaches of your school's behavior policy, and that pupil's behavior means that allowing the pupil to remain in school would seriously harm the education or welfare of the pupil or others in the school. So for example, if a pupil is persistently late to school or if a, if a pupil persistently um, skips out on going to school, 
that in itself would not necessarily rise to the level of a permanent exclusion because while it is a persistent breach of the school's behavior policy, um, allowing that pupil to remain in school isn't actually going to seriously harm the educational welfare of that pupil or others in the school. There's no set time limit on how long after an incident a head teacher can exclude a pupil and a pupil's behavior outside of school can also be considered as a reason for permanent exclusion, but only if that's in line with your school's behavior policy. You'll sometimes hear about internal exclusions. These aren't formal exclusions and they're not going to fall under the statutory exclusions framework. An example of internal exclusion is sending a child to work in an, in an isolation unit. You'll also hear about something called informal or an unofficial exclusion. These are actually unlawful. It's unlawful to send a pupil home for any length of time without following the statutory exclusions process. The DFE provided an example of sending a pupil home to cool off. So it's important to know that even if the parents agree, any event in which a pupil is sent home is considered an exclusion and all formal exclusion procedures must be followed. We're going to be discussing the exclusion process now. We're going to be going into some technical stuff here, but don't worry about jotting down anything or memorizing anything. Again, the deck will be available to you after the webinar, and don't forget that you can ask questions as we go along. Only head teachers are those acting in the capacity of head teacher. This means a, an acting up deputy head teacher if the head teacher isn't available at the time can decide uh, to exclude a pupil. In all of these cases, the decision to exclude must be lawful, rational, reasonable, fair, and proportionate. Head teachers also have the power to withdraw the exclusion, assuming that the governing board hasn't convened a panel to consider that exclusion. And in all cases, the head teacher must notify without delay the parents, the local authority, that in which the school is, plus that of the pupil if the pupil lives in a different local authority, and the governing board. There's gonna be a lot of text on these next slides, and that's really more for your future reference. I'm gonna hit the bigger points right now and clarify some of the statutory language for you. This is your role in the exclusions process. Depending on the circumstances of the exclusion itself, you could be called on to perform any number of tasks, which might include sitting on a governor's exclusion panel, chairing a governor's exclusion panel, making sure that alternative education is provided to pupils who have had a fixed term exclusion of more than five days, considering complaints from the parents related to that exclusion, or even sitting on an independent review panel in an appeals process, assuming that you've been through the proper training. When a pupil is excluded, the governing board has a duty to consider the reinstatement of the pupil. This is the language that you're going to find in the guidance, but on a practical level, what that means is that the governing board has the power to do one of two things. You can either uphold the head teacher's decision, or you can choose to reinstate the pupil, which means permit the pupil to return to school. You also have a duty to consider parents' representations about the exclusion. Again, that's more statutory language, but it means simply that you have to hear the parents out on why they think this exclusion was wrongful. Parents can make representations in person, in writing, or through a representative. The statutory guidance also says you have to make reasonable endeavors to set the meeting at a time that's convenient for all parties. This is exactly what it sounds like, but you still have to remain within the statutory time frame. If the parents don't comply with your efforts to accommodate them within the, within the time limit, the meeting can go ahead uh, without them present. Parents can still send rip, written representations even though they're not there. What you'll see here is a flow chart. And the only thing that's really important to know at this stage is to know that there are different time frames in which you must, in which you as a governing board must hear, uh, must hear the, um, must, must hear about the exclusion. Uh, there's a time limit of 15 days for all permanent exclusions, all fixed term exclusions for pupils who've been excluded for 15 or more days in a term, as well as any fixed term, uh, fixed term exclusion that results in a pupil missing a public exam or national curriculum test. When we refer to school days, what we mean is the number of days in which the school is open. For example, if in the middle of those 15 school days, you have five days of inset, then those five days don't count. It's strictly 15 school days, 15 days in which pupils are present in the school. <laughs> 
for most everything else, there's a time limit of 50 school days. But again, that's not anything that we really need to go into right now. Just know that that information is there. We're gonna go ahead and call it a governor's exclusion panel, but you might also hear it referred to as a disciplinary committee or a behavior panel. The name will vary um, from school to school, but it all pretty much means the same thing. It's a small group of governors uh, that have been delegated the duty to consider whether an exclusion was wrongful. All you need to take away from today is that there are some statutory requirements for the size of the panel that apply to maintain schools and that academies, as ever, should check their articles of association. With regards to membership, just remember that any member of the panel should be impartial. This means that they don't know the people or know the circumstances around the exclusion. And in other words, they haven't discussed it with the staff or the head teacher. They really shouldn't know anything about it at all. Though there aren't really any, stat any statutory rules uh, regarding some governors not being permitted to sit on the panel, there are just some that really shouldn't if you can avoid it if possible. For example, when it comes to staff governors, it's gonna be really unlikely that the staff governor won't have prior knowledge of the pupil. Also, there's the possibility that the staff governor works for the head teacher and would be uncomfortable making a decision that might go against the head teacher's decision. When it comes to parent governors, they can normally sit on the panel as long as they don't know who the child is. And also try not to have a parent on the panel that has a child in the same year, um, in the same year in the same group as the people being excluded. You may also hear about associate members or people who aren't trustees. These are just members of the, of the governing board that, that aren't official governors or trustees. Um, just like in any other committee, associate members uh, can sit on, a, on an exclusions panel as long as there are three other members that are governors, that's the maintained schools, and check your articles of association to see whether people who aren't trustees can sit on the panel in academy. Now we're going to be talking about the procedures. This is just a very, very brief overview of how the governor's exclusion panel is going to work. The clerk is going to collect any needed documents and evidence before the meeting and make sure that all the parties involved receive copies of what they need. There are some people who must be invited to the meeting. Now, just recognize that the that the title in this article is, in the, on this page is actually pretty misleading. They don't they don't have to attend, but they do have to be invited. And this includes the parents, the head teacher, as well as a representative of the local authority if you're in a maintained school. In academies, you're not required to have a representative of the LA, but the parents may invite them as an observer. In which case, uh, that that representative um, can make representations as long as the panel consents. Now, there are also other people who may attend. Parents have the right to be accompanied by a friend or a representative. Uh, this person is there to accompany and support the parent. But you should also permit that friend or representative to make statements or ask questions on the parent's behalf if they, if they request it. Um, if you'd like, you can have the questions determined beforehand uh, so that the attendees can get them in advance of the meeting, but that's not actually necessary. The pupil is also encouraged to attend and speak on their own behalf if they choose to do so. And though, though there's no set procedure for conducting the meeting, we do have a little flow chart here that I won't go over now, but you can review later, that just suggests how you can, how you can conduct this meeting. Once you've heard all the parties and it's time to deliberate, deliberate everyone should withdraw from, from the panel except, uh, except for the clerk. The clerk's gonna stay behind to help you refer to notes if the panel needs it, as well as to help the panel with the wording of any decision let letter. They're also there to minute the reasons behind the committee's decision. Now, the standard of proof in an exclusions hearing is that of being more likely than not. You're probably more familiar with the criminal standard of proof of being beyond a reasonable doubt, but that's not where we're at when it comes to exclusion. More likely than not simply means it's 51% likely that this thing happened and therefore supports the exclusion. Now, 
making the decision, obviously, it's a big responsibility. What you're going to see here is a list of things you, you might consider at the point of deliberation, but we're not going to go over them one by one at this, at this time. The big picture here is that you need to decide whether that exclusion is lawful, rational, reasonable, fair, and proportionate. Once you've come to your decision, then you have to communicate that decision. Remember, you have the power to do one of two things. You can either uphold the head teacher's decision to exclude, or you can reinstate the pupil. Once you've made that decision, you must notify the parent, the head teacher, and the LA, both of the school and where the pupil resides, that the pupil resides in a different local authority. And this, this notification should be done in writing and without delay. Permanent exclusions have a huge impact on a pupil, so there's a pretty lengthy list of statutory requirements that have to go into your notice to the parents if you uphold one. Again, we're not gonna go over these one by one, but just know that there's a number of things that have to be in your decision letter if you decide to uphold a permanent exclusion. It is possible for parents to appeal an exclusion, and there are two different routes that they can take if they choose to do so. The first is by requesting an independent review panel. This is just a, a panel of three or five people that will be convened either by the local authority for maintained schools or the trusts and academies. And they're trained to hear appeals from permanent exclusions. Parents can also make a claim under the Equality Act 2010 if they believe that the exclusion was a result of discrimination. This would be a hearing in front of the tribunal. And it's important to note that these can action actually happen concurrently. Both of these are going to be quite rare and beyond what we're going to be discussing today, but if you ever find yourself in this circumstance, it's probably best to seek legal advice. Now, there are gonna be some special considerations that you need to make whenever you're looking at exclusions, and we're gonna go over those right now. Sorry, just having technical difficulties here. Pupils can only be excluded for behavior-related reasons. In the case of a permanent exclusion, both of these things must be true. It has to be in response to a serious breach or persistent breaches of the school's behavior policy and that pupil's behavior means that allowing the pupil to remain in school would seriously harm their education or that of their fellow pupils. Exclusions for any other reason are going to be unlawful. For example, you can't exclude a pupil because their parents are being disruptive. You can't exclude them because they have a special educational need that the school doesn't feel they can meet. They can't be excluded because they're not performing well academically or because they haven't met specific conditions to be, re to be readmitted to school, for instance, for not attending a reintegration meeting. When you're considering whether or not an exclusion is rational and reasonable, you can look at the principles of judicial review to understand what this means. The questions that you're going to be asking yourself is, did the head teacher rely on a relevant point? Did they fail to take account of all relevant points? Did they make a decision so unreasonable that no head teacher acting reasonably in such circumstances could have made that decision? Now, obviously, this is going to require a bit of subjective thinking, but if you just approach it from that way, this is one of the considerations that you need to make when you're deciding whether or not to uphold that exclusion or to reinstate the pupil. But when it comes to deciding whether an exclusion is fair and proportionate, you're necessarily going to have to look at that pupil individually. And all governors should be aware that some pupil groups are more likely to experience exclusion than others. This is necessarily going to touch on issues of equality, which is what we're going to discuss next. We're going to be talking about Vulnerable Pupils and the Equality Act 2010. Some groups have disproportionately high rates of exclusion. This is going to include pupils with special educational needs, children who qualify for free school meals, looked after children and previously looked after children, as well as certain ethnic backgrounds. For instance, children from Gypsy Roma families, travelers of Irish heritage, and pupils uh, and Caribbean pupils. 
Another special consideration are for those pupils with EHC plans and looked after children. Pupils that have education, health and care plans and looked after children are particularly vulnerable to the impact of exclusion, so much so that the guidance says that head teachers should, as far as possible, avoid permanently excluding these pupils. So whenever these pupils come before you to be to have their exclusion considered, you need to take a closer look at the circumstances related to that pupil's exclusion. And what I mean by that is that you need to be looking for evidence that the school has um, has taken every step that it can in order to prevent that exclusion in the first place. For instance, you're gonna be looking for evidence that the school engaged proactively with parents, social workers, foster carers, and the local authority to support pupils. You're also gonna be looking for steps that they took to identify and address any specific needs of, of, of those pupil groups, as well as steps they took to intervene early and try to mitigate any problems before they reach the level of becoming an exclusion. You're probably familiar with the Equality Act 2010, but your obligations under the Equality Act actually extend to exclusion. And this means that pupils can't be excluded on the basis of sex, race, religion or belief, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, age or disability. Now there is one exception there. There are some rules related to age that don't apply in schools, but those don't, those aren't anything that we're going to be discussing right now. These are the different types of discrimination that you might find in an exclusion. And we're gonna be talking about these in some detail right now. Direct discrimination is what most people think of when you think about discrimination. Um, this, would be this would be discriminating against somebody specifically because they have a protected characteristic. For example, excluding a pupil for getting pregnant or for being transgender. Indirect discrimination is a bit trickier to find because it isn't as obvious and it requires you to think about whether pupils with a protected characteristic would be more likely to be impacted by a policy than children who don't have that protected characteristic. Uniform policies are generally really ripe for these issues. So just to give you some examples, if your school has a policy that prohibits dreadlocks or braids, this is probably going to have a disparate impact on pupils of Caribbean descent. Or if your school has a policy that, that prohibits all jewelry, that could have an unfair impact on pupils who wear specific items of jewelry as part of their religious observation. And then discrimination arising from disability can be even more complex, but it's pretty similar to ind indirect discrimination. In these cases, a pupil might not be excluded because of their disability directly, but the disability created a set of circumstances that led to the exclusion. So very recently, you may have read in the news about a school that was found to have unlawfully excluded a pupil because that pupil had been behaving violent, violently toward a teacher. But in this case, the court found that the child was autistic and determined that aggressive behavior isn't a choice for autistic children. So in this particular case, the pupil was wrongfully, was wrongfully excluded despite the fact that he had violated the behavior policy and that both of the both of the arms of the test to determine whether or not a permanent exclusion is lawful were met. The fact is, is that the court found that when aggressive behavior isn't a choice, that it's something that arose from a disability. This in fact was discrimination based on disability and that exclusion was unlawful. One of the things that you need to consider if you ever have to consider the exclusion of a pupil that has, um, that has aggressive behavior. In March of 2018, the government commissioned a review of school exclusion specifically to study current exclusion practice and to understand why some groups of pupils are more likely to be excluded for others. This was called the Timpson Report. And as a result of that report, we expect to see some big changes this year. In the report, there were over 30 recommendations for the government to make changes. And in response to that, the government made four core promises. So the government's first promise was that they were gonna support head teachers to maintain safe and orderly environments for the benefit of all pupils and staff. 
The second promise was to support schools to put effective interventions in place to give pupils at risk of exclusion the best chance to succeed. The third promise was to provide greater, greater clarity on when and how it's appropriate for pupils to be removed and make sure that there's sufficient oversight when pupils move around the education system. And finally, to support schools and alternative provision providers so excluded pupils continue to receive a high quality education. The first promise is that the government um, will hold schools accountable for the outcomes of permanently excluded pupils. This isn't quite as straightforward as it seems. The way things are right now, um, well, let me start over. The, the, the purpose of this is that this is in response to what's been called off-rolling, which you've probably heard about in the news. Off-rolling can be a lot of different things, but it includes schools that push poor, per, poor performing pupils out of school in order to protect their positions in league tables. So by making schools accountable for pupils' outcomes, even if they're excluded, the belief is that schools won't have the incentive to off-roll pupils. The other side of this, is that it will make schools economically responsible for excluded pupils. Right now, schools are responsible for providing alternative provision only for those pupils who are temporarily excluded for more than five days. And the local authority is responsible for paying for alternative provision for permanently excluded pupils. By making schools financially responsible for permanently excluded pupils, schools theoretically will have less incentive to permanently exclude. But of course, this is going to have the unintended consequence of raising the incentive to off-roll. In other words, use coercion to convince pupils and their parents to withdraw from school voluntarily, which is why the government has agreed that they're going to be consulting on this. The second promise is that they're going to be updating the exclusions guidance by September 2020. Because there was such a lack of uniformity in exclusions practice, for example, behavior that gets people excluded in one school might not get them excluded in, in others. Carrying weapons is a good example. It's possible for one school to have a zero tolerance policy and that pupils are excluded immediately when weapons are found, whereas other schools may have a, a more lax policy and look at pupils you know, individually, look at the circumstances individually. So with this lack of uniformity, um, the exclusions guidance is going to be updated in order to provide more stringent guidelines, uh, not just on that, but also in how to use in-school units. Some schools were using them well, but for those that weren't using them uh, properly, it was possible to remove pupils from education without actually formally excluding them. Another thing that's going to be updated in the exclusions guidance has to do with managed moves. Managed moves are where you move a, move a pupil from one school to another specifically in order to find that pupil a school that can address a behavior, a behavior problem or something similar uh, to find that pupil a school where they have a better chance for success. And while many schools used uh, managed moves as well thought out alternatives to, um, to, to work out something in the people's best interest, lack of guidance has also led to a bunch of uncoordinated moves to just basically shunt pupils from school to school to move liability for that pupil uh, down the line. Another thing that they'll be looking at are fixed term exclusions because the way that things are currently, Schools are only required to arrange alternative provision for exclusions that last more than five days. But since pupils can be excluded for up to 45 days in a school year, it's technically possible for a child to be out of education for all 45 days if each exclusion is for five days or less. So in response to all of these problems, the government intends to update its guidance to ensure uniformity, not only in exclusions, but also in behavior management and discipline. It's also going to consider changing the rules on fixed term exclusions after having that public consultation. Hasn't gone so far as to say when they'll do that though. Another promise will have a direct impact on governing boards and that governing boards will now be expected to review all pupil movements. As of right now, governing boards already review exclusions and in terms of numbers, how many pupils were excluded and behavior management. But now governing boards, directors of children's services and local forums of schools are going to be expected to review information on pupils who leave 
regardless of whether that was through exclusion or otherwise, and establish a shared understanding of how that data feeds into local trends. In other words, they want to be able to track together what happens to these pupils once they leave school. The goal is going to be improved practice and to reduce those disparities within schools. And it's going to look specifically at pupils at greatest risk of exclusion, such as those with special education needs, or pupils with a social worker, or pupils from certain uh, ethnic backgrounds. The fourth promise is that the government plans to work with Ofsted to define and tackle off-rolling. Believe it or not, despite all of the news, there's still no official definition of off-rolling. So Ofsted currently defines it as the practice of removing a pupil from the school role without a formal permanent exclusion or by encouraging a parent to remove their child from the school role when the removal is primarily in the interest of the school rather than in the best interest of the pupil. Under the, 2000, un, under the updated offset inspection framework, today schools found doing it will have their leadership and management judged inadequate. But given the fact that we still don't have a legal definition of what off-rolling is, this is something that, uh, that the government plans to tackle and tighten up for the future. Another promise made by the government is to increase support for alternative provision. This is more about rebranding and um, bringing, in, bringing in better staff. Uh, the report itself asks the government to make a capital investment in alternative provision uh, as, as a priority. And the government hasn't made any specific commitment to this aside from conducting a budget review. However, it is committed to creating a new uh, alternative provision workforce program, and this is to attract and develop high, high quality staff. The idea is to, is to advance alternative provision as high quality specialist education rather than its current, its current um, uh, view as being uh, lesser quality schools for problem children, just a place to to, to, to put pupils that are, are creating problems, but not necessarily a place that's actually designed to meet the needs of high need pupils. As I'd mentioned earlier, there were over 30 recommendations from the government. So um, there was plenty going on uh, within, the, within the text of the Timpson report. And if you haven't read it yet, um, I recommend that you do because uh, there's quite a bit going on in there and there's a lot of interesting points to be made about how exclusions happen in this country who exclusions happen to, um, who does it well, and what can be done to uh, create reforms across the system. Uh, there were more key points that were made. I'm not going to go over them here and now. This is something that you can review later if you'd like. Um, but for now, we've reached the end of this presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions from you if you have any to ask. All right, one of the questions that we received is whether um, notice can be sent by the governing board or whether that notice can be delegated to the clerk. Generally speaking, it's the clerk that will send out any, um, any sort of uh, communication from the governing board. It's not normally done by the governing board itself. Um, another question that we've just received is um, who can bring an appeal if the parents have a language uh, or, or other understanding issues? Uh, whether a representative um, supporting the parent can bring the appeal. Technically, the appeal is brought on behalf of the parent. So in that respect, then yes, it can be brought by a representative of the parent. But if the question is, it has to be done with the understanding of the parent. The mere fact that, that a parent has a, has a, you know, has, has a language barrier that in and of itself isn't sufficient to prevent the, the parent from bringing from being from bringing an appeal so um, but the school should be aware of any any language barriers that exist and take steps to communicate with the parent and that's not that's just that's just Equality Act 2010 uh, the school has the obligation to ensure that all parents can access uh, can access the school equally and this includes language barriers Another question that I've received is, is it a legal requirement for panel members to be trained before they sit on a panel? 
at the level of the of the governor's exclusion panel no there are no requirements specifically for training that's not to say that training isn't useful or appropriate and if you if you have access to training you should certainly take it but there are no requirements at the governing board level however at independent review panel level those go, those um those individuals that sit on that panel have received specialist training, and that training was taken within the two years prior to sitting on the panel. So it, if you haven't had that training, you won't be asked to sit on an independent review panel, but um, you can sit on the, on the exclusions review panel without having any specific training. I've been asked, if you have a child that hasn't yet been diagnosed with ADHD and is, but is in the process of doing so, would you consider this to be a reason not to exclude permanently? This is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis because, as as mentioned, there are there there are two there are two things that have to be true in order for a pupil to be permanently excluded. If a pupil is in the process of being diagnosed with with ADHD. It would probably be prudent to seek legal advice um, because that would that would really depend on the circumstances. Is it something that should give a governing board pause? Yes, but is that in itself a bar to permanent permanently excluding a pupil? No. I've been asked if the excluded child goes to another school, can the new school reject this admission if they decide that the child if they decide that the child was excluded, that the reason the child was excluded was too serious for them to deal with. Um, it depends on the school. In a maintained school, the local authority, the, in maintained schools, you, a school can refuse to, uh, can refuse to accept a pupil if they've been excluded from another, if they've been excluded twice in the past. So if this is the second exclusion, yes. In academies, again, you have to look to your articles of association, I believe, um, or that might be true for academies too. Uh, actually, that's something that I'm going to have to come back to you on in terms of academies. But for maintained schools, uh, they do have to have been excluded twice before a school can choose not to accept a pupil. Another question, in a, in a multi-academy trust, who is classed as the principal of the school when issuing a permanent exclusion if there's no senior cluster principal over principal. This really depends on the scheme of delegation within your school, how your school is structured. But generally speaking, the head teacher is going to be whoever is responsible for the operational running of the school on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but whether or not that person actually has authority is going to be decided at the um, at the uh, centralized level of the trust. Okay. Well, we'll wait uh, another two or three minutes to give you an opportunity to get your questions in if you have any more. I've been asked um, whether or not, oh, who in a who in a multi academy trust is classed as a governor? Well, in a multi academy trust at the trust level, which means that at the at the at the level at the top level of the trust, you've got the board of trustees, and under the board of trustees in each individual school, you may have or you may not have what's called either a local advisory board or a local governing body. Um, for those for those governors that sit at the local advisory board of the local governing body, they're not technically classed as as trustees. Uh, they are, but but whether when it comes to discussions about exclusions, you really need to look to your terms of reference because there's it's very likely that the local governing body is empowered to um, to handle exclusions. So in Matt. Look to your scheme of delegation if you're a local governing if you're a local governor, and also look to your uh, articles of association and uh, your scheme of delegation in order to see where power sits and who has who has the power to do what. I've been asked, can the exclusion happen even if everyone on the board is not in agreement with what the pupil is being excluded for? 
that's a bit of a trick question because the governing board isn't sitting there determining whether or not they agree with why the pupil was excluded. Um, what you're looking at is whether you're upholding the head teachers, the head teachers' um, decision or not. And for that to happen, you're looking at whether the head teacher was fair, reasonable, um, all of these things. In the end, you can determine that the head teacher was being fair, was being reasonable, reasonable, was being rational, was being proportionate, and still not agree with the underlying, you know, with the underlying reasoning for that. But just like in any other decision made by the governing board, it's done by a majority of votes. 